This sermon is titled How to Receive Divine Healing Part 3 Be enriched as you listen So today the la- being the last Sunday of the month we intentionally set this aside as our supernatural Sunday It's a Sunday when we encourage faith in our hearts through a simple message from the Word of God, encourage our faith uh, to believe God for healing, body and mind, to believe God for miracles, to believe God to work in our life situations. And so we're going to do that. And I want to encourage all of us to open up our hearts with expectation. Can we do that? Right? Just have expectation. That means you anticipate that God will work in your life, in your circumstance, in your situation, whether it's healing that you and I need or it's something else, just anticipate, expect God. Expectation is so important and it's a good thing to have. Amen? So just right now, at this moment, just between you and God, you say, God, I am expecting you. I invite you to come and work in my life. Uh, whatever area of, of your life you need. Each one of us may be having something different. Whatever area of life you need God to work in this morning. Just expect. Just open up. It's between you and God. Say, Lord, I want you to come and do this for me. Just God hears your prayer. And, he, and your expectation is opening up the door. An invitation to God to come and work in your life. Now, over the last several Supernatural Sundays, we've been outlining the w- different ways in which God works. So God works in a diverse, in diversity of ways. And there's just not one, the one and only way God will work. God works in so many different ways. And He is a creative God, a big God. You, we can't put God in a box and say, you know, this is, this is the only way God works. So God works in diversities of ways. And the, the thing is, God has revealed to us in the Bible the, His ways. He's made known His ways to us. And so we can examine the Scripture, understand the ways of God, and then just position ourselves, stand in His ways, the ways in which He works, so that we can receive from God. So that's what we've been doing, just looking at some of the ways in which God works healing, so that you and I can position ourselves to receive. So I just want to quickly... Uh, uh, review some of the things we've shared in previous uh, Supernatural Sundays, and then we're going to look at just three this morning. In the first one, we said that this God works through His Word and personal faith. God works through His Word and our personal faith in His Word. So it's so important for us just to understand that this Word is like medicine. You know, Proverbs 4.20, God says, you know, this word is medicine to your whole body. So one medicine takes care of you, head to toe, right? His word. And so he says, pay attention to this word. And so as we meditate in the word and have faith in this word, we can receive healing, personal faith. Another way that God works is through the quickening. Of his indwelling spirit. So the Holy Spirit is in you. And he's not sleeping definitely inside you. But he is at work. And the Bible says that the same spirit who raised up Jesus from the dead. He's dwelling in you. He is giving life to your mortal body. Yes, we understand this body is mortal. It's growing old. It's decaying. But there's somebody inside who's giving life to it. So that every day of your earthly life, the Spirit of God is imparting life to every cell in your body. You and I believe that. The Holy Spirit in me is giving life to every cell in my body. Amen? The third thing we said is through the life of God inside you. Through the power of His life in you. That is the Zoe life. Eternal life. You see, eternal life doesn't begin after you cross the pearly gates in heaven. Oh, now I have eternal life. No. Eternal life begins the moment you receive the one who is life, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the life. And the moment you receive him, 
eternal life begins in you. It starts in you right then, right there. Because the one who is life has come into you. The Bible says, he who has the Son has life. So you have life. And what does this eternal life in you do? It's not lying dormant. The Bible says his life shines in darkness. Dispelling darkness. That means his life in you is doing something in you. It's driving out everything that's of darkness. It's getting it out of, your life, out of you. So the very fact that you have eternal life positions you to walk in healing and wholeness and strength and experiencing the work of God taking place in your life. That deposit of life in you is driving darkness out of you. Amen? But we need to believe that. Otherwise, we'll just keep it all untapped. God, believe the life of God in me is dispelling darkness out of me. The fourth... Uh, way that we saw that God works is through the receiving the prayer of faith in Jesus' name so somebody can pray the prayer of faith for you. Number five, through the prayer of agreement in faith. And number six, through the healing anointing. Today, we're going to look at three other ways that God heals, that God works in our life situations. And then we're going to step into it. Are you ready? Number seven, and we'll explain each of these. Through a word of command spoken over you in faith. Through a word of command spoken over you in faith. God uses that. Number eight, through partaking in the Lord's table in faith. And number nine, through the ministry of deliverance. We're going to look at these three things today. Three ways, three additional ways through which God heals, through which God works miracles in our body, in our mind, in our emotions, in our circumstances, in our situations. Through a word of command spoken over you in faith. So when we, we look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, how did Jesus heal people? On numerous occasions, we find Jesus just speaking words over people. And we just look at a few. We'll just mention a few. A leper comes to Jesus. And this leper, you know, is saying, Lord, if you, I, if you will, I know you can make me clean. And Jesus looks at him. He says, I am willing. And he speaks two words. Be clean. That's it. Two words. Be clean. And this man who had leprosy, and I don't know how long, maybe for many years, we don't know. And you can just imagine two words spoken over him, and he begins to suddenly feel all these things change in his body. The leprosy begins to leave, and his fingers and toes and other extremities begin to be become whole and clean. Just two words. Now, I think every doctor would say, man, if science was that easy, just get two words down. Blind men come to Jesus. Jesus tells them, according to your faith, be to you. Finish. The eyes begin to open. A centurion comes to Jesus. His servant is at home, uh, terribly tormented. Jesus, Jesus tells him, as you believed, let it be done. Go. So he just speaks words. Peter's mother-in-law is sick, having high temperature. Jesus stands beside her and he tells the fever to go. He rebukes the fever. So Jesus is talking to fever. You don't find it in Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> you don't find it in any of these medical books. Speak to the sickness. It's in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the fever. Commands the fever to go. It goes. 
And there are so many other examples. He tells the blind eyes, be open. Tells the deaf ears, be open. Say, is there something magical in words? No, no. God Almighty has set a principle in place. He has set a divine operation there. Saying when words are spoken in faith, I will begin to get on the scene. God himself gets on the scene. God begins to do something. And when people connect with those words that are spoken in faith, God works. So you can imagine, in one of the services, there was this man, the Bible says, he had his hand withered. Now probably that was polio, I don't know. He was born that way. He never uses that hand. Jesus tells him, stretch out your hand. Lord, you don't understand. I was born like this. I've never used this hand. Never. And you're telling me, stretch out your hand. I don't presume that that man argued with Jesus. In my mind, I can just imagine this man. He's saying, he's telling me to stretch out my hands. I've never done it before. I was born this way. But because he's saying it, let me try. I don't lose anything. Try. So I can just imagine this man beginning to try. Just, it still feels stiff. It still feels immovable. I, I, I don't have the muscles and whatever is wrong with it. But he said, stretch out your hand. I'm going to try. And I can imagine as he tries, something happens. God moves on the scene. The power of God comes upon his arm. I can't explain it, but suddenly he finds his hand. Oh, what was done to him? Words were spoken. Words were spoken. But Almighty God used those words that were spoken as a word of command in faith to move in on this man's situation. And when he connected, something happened, something miraculous happened. At a wedding, we ran out of wine. Now, don't use the story to go drink wine. That's not the point. But anyway, let's focus on the miracle. They ran out of wine. And Jesus tells them, fill the water pots with water. And if you and I were there, we say, Lord, they don't need water. We already serve them plenty of that. They need wine. But he said, fill the water pots with water. We'll do it. His mother gave them good advice. Whatever he tells you, do it. Most mothers say, whatever I tell you, do it. <laughs> but this mother, I knew she had a very different son. Anointed by the Holy Spirit. Whatever he tells you, do it. And so you can imagine these people just filling them up with water. They fill these six big water pots with water. And they look at Jesus, now what? And he says, serve them. Serve the people. And somewhere along the way, these words having been spoken, the miracle of God takes place. Water becomes wine. What we must understand, and there are so many other miracles that we see recorded in the scriptures. What we must understand is this, that God has not stopped working the same way. He still works the same way. 
when words are spoken, these are not empty words. When words are spoken, and when a command is spoken in the name of Jesus with faith, these are words that can cause God to move on the sea. These are words that can cause God to do the miracle that you and I are expecting or anticipating. But what we must do is connect with those words in faith and say, yes, God, it's for me. I'm receiving it. It's for me. And so when maybe it's me here, maybe it's somebody else standing up here, or somebody, you know, personally in your room, wherever, as they are ministering, as they are speaking words of faith. And they say, in the name of Jesus, we command this sickness to go. We command you to be healed. We command me to, you to be whole. We command a miracle in your life. We command a situation to change. We command your need to be met. We command the mountain to be moved. As these words of faith are being spoken over you, connect it to them with faith and expect Almighty God to work in your life. It's not those words, but that is creating an opportunity for God to do something for you and me. And God still works that same way. Are you listening? God still works the same way today. So today, later on, I'm going to speak words, we're going to speak healing. And at that moment, you say, yes, God. If, the, if you're in that situation where you need, you say, yes, God, I receive it. And to those of you who are watching live, it doesn't matter which part of the world you're watching. It's not, there is no distance in the realm of the Spirit. As words of faith are spoken right from here, God will move right where you are. And you can expect healing right there. The next one that we're going to look at how God heals is through partaking in the Lord's table in faith. Through partaking in the Lord's table in faith. Now, when we are studying Scripture, one of the things that we will find in the Bible is what in hermeneutics, that is the way you interpret the Bible, we call it types and shadows. But it's actually very simple. It sounds complicated. Very simple. So think about a shadow. So when you see the shadow of a tree, the shadow tells you some aspects of the reality. So there is a real tree. Without a real tree, you will never have the shadow. So the fact that there is a shadow, it's pointing you to a reality. Saying there is a reality, there's a real thing coming up. But you're first seeing the shadow. The shadow has some resemblance. It tells you some aspects of it. Oh, this is a maybe, you know, very big tree. Sometimes you may be able to see some of the branches in the tree. Sometimes you may be able to even see the outline of leaves. So the shadow is a prefiguring. It's telling you something about the reality. But it's definitely not giving you the sum totality of the reality. The reality is much greater, much more real, much more bigger, much more powerful than the shadow. But the shadow is pointing you to the reality. And in the Bible... God has placed types and shadows. The word type is another word for shadow. He has placed types and shadows in the Old Testament. And the New Testament looks back and says, Ha ha, that was a shadow. This is the reality. Are you all with me so far? You're not lost in the shadows? So one of these shadows or types in the Old Testament is the Passover. The Passover. So in Exodus, the 12th chapter, try to think about this. The Hebrews, they had been in slavery for 400 years. That's a long time. For 400 years, they worked under the Egyptians. And all their labor were being enjoyed by the Egyptians. They worked, but the output, the outcome 
went into the pockets of the Egyptians. 400 years. But then God told Moses, Moses, the time has come. I'm going to bring my people out. And here's how I'm going to do it. Tell every household to select a lamb. And he gave the specifications. So it's a, it's a perfect lamb. It has no problems with it. It's the first born, the first lamb. And then they got to take the, they got to kill the lamb, take the blood, tell every household to apply the blood on the doorpost. And then they, they, uh, they cook the lamb a certain way, they eat it. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. They shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts, and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So God says, just, just do this. So imagine you are one of those Hebrew people. You get a lamb, kill it, collect the blood, apply it to the doorpost. Your son asks you, Daddy, what are you doing? You're, you're messing up the place. Son, I'm just following what God told me to do. I was obeying God. Dad, why are you doing this? God said, tonight, we are going to walk out of Egypt free. Dad, you've never been to the army. <laughs> this is not a military strategy. This is not the way you come out of an empire that's controlling us for 100 years. Just supply the blood. Just eat the flesh. So you can imagine. In every house, Hebrew household that night. They applied the blood. And they ate the flesh the way God told them to eat. Cook it and eat it. That's all. And that night. One night. Something happened. The Egyptians told these Hebrew people, come, take anything and everything. Take it. And it says, in one night, all the wealth of Egypt was transferred into the hands of the Hebrews. In one night. Imagine if you were one of them. You're going into their house. You're picking up the gold. You're picking, you put it in your pockets. You put it in your bags. You put it in all your suitcases. And they are not doing anything. They are happy that you're taking all the wealth. Collecting all the gold. Collecting all the precious stones. Collecting everything. And they are not doing a single thing. One night. And then after you've packed your bags, say, so what next? Let's go. And an entire nation walks out of Egypt. And these Egyptians are not stopping them. They're just walking out. Leaving Egypt. They're walking out. If you and I were there, Maybe looking back, hey, are they coming? What's happening? They're not chasing us. It might happen a long way later, long time later. But they walked out of Egypt. And the psalmist puts it like this in Psalm 105, verse 37. I want us all to read it out loud together, please. Let's read it. He also brought them out with silver and gold. And there was none feeble among his tribes. Let's read it one more time. He also brought them out with silver and gold. And there was none feeble among their tribes. 
The psalmist is recording. This is what happened that night. They came out with silver and gold. And there was not one sick, feeble, weak person among all the tribes. What was it? They applied the blood and they ate the meat of the Passover lamb. And what is interesting is this. That the effect of the first Passover lasted 40 years. So what do you mean? Nehemiah writes this. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 21. Nehemiah 9 verse 21. Let's read it out together please. 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not sweat. Read it one more time because maybe you don't believe it yet. Let's read it again. 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not sweat. Some of us change our wardrobe 40 days. This is 40 years. For 40 years. All those who were obedient to God. They walked in the miracle of that first Passover. For 40 years. He brought them out with silver and gold. Everything changed in their lives in a night. In one night, everything in their life situation changed. They went from being oppressed to being completely delivered. They went from being captives to becoming liberated. They went from all having nothing to having the wealth of Egypt in their hands. They went from being weak and sickly to being people who are completely whole. And they walked in it for 40 years. Now there were some people who were disobedient. Now that was a different problem. And they died in the wilderness. But those who walked in obedience to God. Walked in the miracle of the Passover. The first Passover. 40 years. Now think about this. That was only the shadow. That was only the shadow. That's not the real stuff yet. Come into the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, looking back at that incident, the first Passover, here's what he says. He says, therefore purge, let's read it together please. Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. That means get rid of all the sin and you may be a clean person. Since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ of a Passover was sacrificed for us. That was the shadow. Christ of a Passover is the reality. Christ is the real, true Passover. That Passover lamb was only the shadow. It was a prefiguring. It was a type. It was a pointer to the reality. Christ, I'm a Passover. Say this with me. Christ is my Passover. Say it like you mean it. Christ is my Passover. All right. Say it like you believe it. Christ is my Passover. Paul says, Christ, I'm a Passover. Was sacrificed for us. If the blood of that shadow, Passover, lamb, not the real, just the shadow, would so protect the people of God that night, would so change their life situations in one night, and that they could walk in it for the rest of their lives, 40 years after that. How much more would the blood of Christ, the true Passover lamb, 
work be effective for you and for me? How much more? Whether it's a change in our circumstances, whether it's a healing in our body, it says they lacked nothing. Their feet did not swell. Their clothes did not wear out. They walked in it for 40 years. And Paul also goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He tells us something. The same episode. He says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, he's saying something more. He's saying, you know, we drink this cup. What are we doing? This cup that we drink, it's a communion in the blood of that Passover lamb, Christ of a Passover. That word communion is old English word. Simply means I am partaking. I'm becoming one with, I'm participating, I am receiving off. It's the cup of blessing. I am receiving the blessing of the blood of the Passover lamb. Those people, they had to apply it on the dopos. You and I, we drink this cup. Simple. It's not about the cup. So not about the juice. But when we do it, God Almighty moves in our life. The same God, the same God who moved on that very first Passover night. Same God. Ready to move in on your life, on my life. Each time we drink this cup. Are you listening? And then Paul says, the bread that we eat, it is partaking of the body of Christ, the Passover lamb. They, they roasted the flesh and they ate it the, the way God told them to do it. Here, we partake of the bread. And when we partake of the bread, we are saying, I am receiving, I am sharing in what this Passover lamb has done for me. I'm sharing in that. I'm receiving that over my life. That's why every time we partake of the Lord's table, we try to encourage people. Believe that you receive everything that Jesus provided for us through the cross. You are receiving the blessing. You're coming under the blood. You're saying, I'm eating off that Passover lamb and everything that Christ provided for me. I am receiving it for me and my house. Amen. So today, I will be finishing the sermon today. <laughs> but after we finish the sermon, you and I are going to partake. But I want to invite you to do it like those people did it. Did they understand everything? Of course not. They just obeyed. Do we understand everything? No. But I know enough that Jesus died for me on the cross. And I know what he did for me on the cross. And I also believe that when we partake of this cup and when we eat of this bread, the Bible says, I am receiving Christ my Passover. That's enough for me. And I believe 
God moves in over my life. That God who moved over every Hebrew household that night. He didn't leave any one of them out. He moved on every one of those homes and protected them and delivered them. He took care of them, everyone. He will move on each one of us. Us, our homes, our families, all come under the blood of the Passover lamb. God, I receive it. And if that was shadow could do so much for them, how much more the reality? How much more the reality? I'm not going to try to figure this out in my mind. How is the power of God going to come in? And how is it going to change my life? I don't know. I just believe that when we do it the way God told us to do it, He will do His part. He will move in your life. He will touch your body. He will touch your mind. He will touch your situations. He will touch your circumstances. How? I don't know. But God will do it. We just believe. And receive. Last one. We look at it very quickly. That is ministering through, through the ministry of deliverance. What is clear to us is, in the Bible, is that there are certain problems that you and I may face. That are the direct result of Satan and his demonic spirits. Sometimes these problems could be in our body, in our mind, in our life situations, our circumstances. And these things are a direct result of evil spirits at work. Now, we have to be discerning, of course, and... We shouldn't just blame everything on the devil. Don't fall into that side of the ditch because we have responsibility. Right? We have to do our part. If somebody's not managing their finances well, don't say the devil is taking my money away. You probably don't have enough for him to take anyway, so I'm <laughs> just joking. I'm just, that was a joke, okay? So don't just blame the devil. If you're not, if you're not managing your money properly, don't blame the devil, right? Don't fall on that side of the ditch. But neither should we end up on the other side of the ditch where we deny the fact that there is a devil who does bad things. That he tries to steal, kill, and destroy and interfere in our life situations and trouble us and all kinds of things. So, be discerning. So when you need help, get help. So you can counsel people. So you go to a counselor. Somebody can advise you or advise in whatever language you want. Get some help. Somebody can counsel you, can give you advice, can coach you, tell you how to manage things well. So, so you can counsel people, but you can't counsel the devil. Demons have to be cast out. So you counsel people, but he cast out the devil. And since in many situations, we need both. We need to do both. Where uh, people need the right kind of advice. They need the right kind of guidance. But we also need, because the devil takes advantage of those situations. And complicates it, aggravates it, makes it more difficult. And so we also need to deal with the work of demonic spirits. So whether it's a physical healing, something in the mind, the mental, emotional, whether it's a life situation, understand that these two things are very real. Somebody says, oh, I don't believe the devil exists. I don't believe demons. Wait till you see a demon possessed person. It'll make a believer out of you in a hurry. You'll go like that. Oh, devil is. Yeah, he is. And God is. <laughs> the devil is, God is, you know. So, this is real. These are facts. And even in the ministry of Jesus, and I'll just reference a few very quickly. Uh, we find, Matthew 8, 16, 17, it says, When the evening was come, they brought to Jesus all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. 
So you see, even Jesus doing that. He casting out the spirits with the word and healing all who are sick. In Matthew 9, 32, 33, uh, the scriptures say that they brought to him a man who was mute. That means he couldn't speak. And what was the cause of his muteness, his inability to speak? It says he was demon-possessed. And what did Jesus do? He didn't send him to therapy. Therapy has its place. But this time, verse 33, it says, And when the demon was cast out, he spoke. So this was a demon that affected his ability to speak. And like this, you'll find many examples in the New Testament. But an evil spirit, a woman who was bent over, Jesus said there's a spirit of infirmity. So we need to discern. We're not saying every sickness is caused by evil spirits, but there are some conditions that are caused by evil spirits. And so in those situations, healing comes because when that spirit of infirmity is cast out. Are you with me? And so when we minister to people, we take authority. Or spirits that are causing sickness and disease, uh, affecting the body and the mind. We command them to leave. Because it's a biblical way by which healing can be ministered to people. And every one of us as believers can do this because we've been given the authority to do this in the name of Jesus. You say, in the name of Jesus, devil, I command you to go. You say, devil, you who are interfering in my circumstance, my situation, I bind you. I command you to leave. You can do it. You have the authority to do it as a believer. Amen? Worship team, please go. So, this morning, this is the most important part now. Because you and I are going to act. You and I are going to just look to God. We've heard the word, but we must now look to God. I don't know what you personally need. To receive from God today. If you're in perfect health, just thank God. Just thank God for it. It's wonderful. But if you need healing in your body, in your mind, or you need God to work in your life situation, whatever it may be, maybe family, maybe financial, maybe in your career, your profession, uh, maybe a legal case, maybe a, a you know a situation with property, whatever. You know, we could all be having different challenges. That's part of life. But there's a way by which we can receive from God and say, God, I want you to work in my life. He's given us the Lord's table. He so said, do this often. So as we partake, and you can remain seated, as we partake of the Lord's table today, I want us to do it as an expectation. Now, if, if, if you didn't bring these elements in, please raise your hand and our ushers will serve you in case you don't have the elements with you. They'll come to you and serve you. Just, just raise your hand. If you already have brought it, that's fine. If you don't have these elements with you, please raise your hand. But I want us to do it with that simple faith, those first Hebrews would have had. I mean, imagine you're one of those people there that first Passover night. You're applying the blood to, blood to the doorpost of your house. And you are eating that Passover lamb. It's very simple. And yet, God used that simple obedience to turn everything around in their lives. From that night, everything changed. Everything changed. Today, as we partake of these elements, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you love the Lord, He's your Lord and your Savior. As you partake of this, just do it in simple faith. God, you said, when I drink this cup, it's a cup of blessing. It's bringing the blessing 
of Christ, my Passover, whatever he provided for me, it's bringing that into my life. It's a cup of blessing I receive. You said, when I drink this cup, I am partaking in the blood. What the blood of Jesus, the Passover lamb, has done for me. I'm coming under the blood. I accepted God. Me and my house are coming under the blood. You said, when I eat this bread, I'm partaking in his body. I receive it, God. I receive what Christ my Passover has done for me. And God, if you could do such a great deliverance for them that Passover night, I believe you can do that and much more in my life. I believe you can. So, he's just asking for simple obedience, simple faith. Would you just bow your head, please? And just, just say, God, if you did such a great work, then you can do it now in my life. I don't know what your situation is. But it's between you and God. What is that deliverance? What is that work that God needs to do in your life? He's given us the simple way of expressing our faith. A simple way to receive. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you, God. We don't understand everything. We don't understand everything, God. But you said Christ is our Passover. Christ is the reality. And He will do in us and for us everything and more than that first Passover. There was complete deliverance. There was a complete turnaround. There was complete healing that night. You brought your people out with silver and gold. There was not one feeble person. For 40 years you sustained them. They lacked nothing. Their feet did not swell. Their clothes did not wear out. Christ is our Passover. And Father, this morning, this afternoon, as we partake of these elements here, God, as we eat this bread, as we drink this cup, we come to Christ, our Passover. And Father, we ask that Jesus Christ will do a mighty work in each of our lives. Healing, delivering, transforming, changing life situations. That the power of Christ, our Passover Lamb, be administered, Father, to each one of us by the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus said, Take it. This is my body that's given for you. That night, on that first Passover night, they ate the flesh of the Passover lamb. Jesus says, this is my body. The Passover, the Christ, our Passover. He says, take it. Let us 
partake of the bread together and say, I receive Christ, my Passover. Let's partake together, please. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The apostle Paul said, this cup of blessing, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? That when we drink this cup, we are saying, I'm, I'm applying the blood. I'm coming under the blood. Christ is my Passover. I'm receiving His blood over my life. Let's partake of the cup together, please. Let's rise for feet. I'm just going to speak words, words of command in faith. I'm going to take authority over every evil spirit, spirits of infirmity, sickness, and disease. That's how the Lord Jesus did it. It's He who is watching over His word to perform it. And as we engage, as we do this, I want you to receive by faith. Connect with God. Father, we've brought ourselves under the blood of the Passover Lamb. We received of His provision for us. We stand under the blood ourselves, our homes, our families are under the blood. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Satan, I take authority over you. I take authority over every evil work. I take authority over every demonic spirit over the lives of the people. Or under the sound of my voice, whether they're here or watching online, wherever they are. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you, Satan, take your hands off of God's property. Take your hands off of our bodies and our minds. Take your hands off of our children. Take your hands off of our families. Take your hands off of our marriages. Take your hands off of our finances, our life situations. In the name of Jesus, every work of the enemy that steals and kills and destroys. In the name of Jesus, I command that to stop. And let the people of God experience the blessing of God. The life, the healing, the victory, the triumph of God in their lives. The blessing of God over them, over their households, over their families, over their finances, over their situations. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over every spirit of infirmity, every spirit of fear and torment. I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. Every yoke of the enemy be broken, be completely removed of our people's bodies and minds. Let the people of God be set free. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every spirit of infirmity, whatever sickness and disease, leave in the name of Jesus. Let bodies be healed, bodies be delivered, minds be delivered. In the name of Jesus. Unclean spirits. 
spirits that are holding people in bondage, in oppression, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. Take your chains off of them. Leave. Let the emotions, the affections, the desires of the people be set free and be clean and be sanctified. In the name of Jesus. And Father, in Jesus' name, we bring our families under the blood. We bring our homes under the blood. We declare that as for me and my house, as for us and our household, we will serve the Lord. Our sons and daughters will serve the Lord. Our grandchildren will serve the Lord. Because this is your covenant with us, Lord. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Father, we bring our places of work, our professions, our careers, the works of our hands under the blood covenant. We declare that places of work are redeemed for us. They are blessed. And it is the Lord our God who gives us the power to make wealth that He may establish His covenant with us, as it says in the Scriptures. Therefore, all the works of our hands are blessed, guided by God for His glory. That God establishes the work of our hands so that His beauty and His glory will be seen through our lives. Thank you, Father. Father, you said in your word that the Lord will increase you more and more, you and your children, you are blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so I declare that over each one of our lives, that God increases us more and more. That we are blessed of the Lord who made heaven and earth. May there be increase in every area of our lives. We declare the, the protection of God that He watches over us and are coming in and are going out. That His angels are given charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. We declare the protection of God over our lives, our homes, our families. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. And Father, we pray that each of us will administer your work in the lives of those we meet, the lives of those we encounter, that we will be channels of your blessing to them as your covenant people. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Before we close right now, is anyone here, you experienced something happen to you right now? As you are partaking of the Lord's table, just praying. Did something happen to you? Just wave your hand so that we could just take your testimony. Anyone here this morning, right now, something happened to you? Just wave your hand. Uh, you know, that you can tell through physical examination. I know that some things you need to go and, you know, do your the medical checkup. But... Something through physical examination, you can say, something happened to me right now. Just wave your hands. Anyone here? Okay. I don't see anything happen. Anyone here? All right. What we do encourage you is that if you have something happen in your life, a testimony, whatever it is, physical, emotional, in your life situations, please send a testimony to testimony at apcw.org just want to hear from you and we will share the testimony with others and glorify god is that okay right so when something happens please share it share about share about it it's not to glorify any man here it's to glorify jesus and for us to celebrate together all right so we're going to declare the benediction we're going to close and uh, yeah let's do that father i just speak over your people and declare May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.